Uh, just a little bit brief history. I promise not to go through every single project on this. Um, but when you think about Hyperledger, very often people think of Hyperledger as one thing, as one singular thing, maybe one project that they might be familiar with. Um, but over the last seven years, we really matured into a portfolio of projects, um, and even I would say a portfolio of communities um, that come together to build these open source uh, code bases um, and communities as well. Um, starting in 2016, 16. Uh, we were formed in 2015, but the first code contribution in 2016, in March of 2016, was Hyperledger Fabric, uh, which today Hyperledger Fabric is one of the most adopted uh, permissioned DLTs in the marketplace when it comes to enterprise use cases as well. Um, after that, we saw uh, Hyperledger Sawtooth come in, Hyperledger Eroja uh, came in at the end of 2016, and that one is actually being used uh, in central bank digital currencies with the um, digital currency in um, Cambodia. Um, and I can go on. There's a lot of great stories within our community um, in digital identity, Hyperledger Aries and in Indy. Um, and uh, in the newer projects, you know, coming through from 2020, addressing really the use cases and the, the, the need for how blockchain is used in the enterprise, things like uh, interoperability with Hyperledger Cactus, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, um, Hyperledger Firefly, um, and uh, our recent no, new recent projects project, uh, Hyperledger Solang. So a couple of things, just as a community, as I said, we continue to be uh, uh, growing. Um, we're very strong. We have over 40,000 contributors with over 1.27 million contributions over the last five years. Um, and we continue to just being a, a place where not only developers, uh, but innovators want to come to. Um, couple news items that we put out today um, uh, and as well as yesterday. First, uh, we welcome some new members into the Hyperledger Foundation. We are a membership organization uh, to participate, to use the code. Um, everything is open, but we do have members. Uh, we welcome the Banque de France and the Bank of Nigeria, uh, two central banks that want to participate and contribute into our ecosystem. Um, they join uh, the Bank of England, the Boston Fed, and MIS, um, who have been members of the Hyperledger Foundation for many years as well. We also welcome the Digital Identity Laboratory of Canada, the work that Canada is doing around digital identity and verifiable credentials. And one of our speakers, Nancy Morris, will be able to talk about this work, um, is really, really uh, ahead of the game in regards to global uh, uh, adoption. And uh, a couple of other members, BCW uh, out of Hong Kong, Casper Labs, as we start thinking about hybrid interoperability, um, DSR Corporation really doing a lot of work in digital identity, and Rialto doing some real estate tokenization projects using uh, Hyperledger. Uh, we also released Hyperledger Firefly, the 1.1 release. Um, and we have Hart Montgomery, who's our chief technical officer here in the room, and will be available for any questions that come up specific from a technology perspective as well. Um, and we're we're very happy to announce that uh, Hyperledger Cactus, a project that has been in our ecosystem uh, since uh, March of 2020 um, and uh, is now going to be known as Mar uh, Hyperledger Cacti. Um, this is one of the first, this is a first for Hyperledger Foundation where we had a project, Hyperledger Cactus, over the last two years, uh, contributions by Accenture and Fujitsu and others, uh, really leading the space around interoperability uh, between blockchains, um, joining with Weaver, which is a lab that was contributed by IBM in June, and those two projects have come together. It's actually two very large code bases, um, and you'll be hearing more about those details soon as well. And we are now calling it cacti because multiple cactuses become a cacti. So um, very appropriate. And then Hyperledger Solang uh, as well, which is a Solidity compiler um, uh, that is, can be used across multiple um, uh, blockchains. Uh, we also just announced uh, a little bit of information around the Bezu Client Incentive Program, and we'll be here to talk about that uh, as well. And the edX course, uh, where self-sovereign identity is just completely, completely um, important for us to get right um, as we move forward. So. Uh, one of the things that uh, Hyperledger has been funding and investing in is our climate action and accounting special interest group and a lot of the work that's happening there, supporting individuals and companies that come together. I'm proud to say that uh, we just got some community recognition for a prototype to reduce methane emissions and supply chain tokens um, by our SIG. Our, our um, and it's a great way to you know, really understand the technology. This use case uses Hyperledger Cactus as well as 
and Ethereum-based uh, centralized applications. So um, great work that's happening in our special interest groups. And for anybody uh, who's interested, they should show up. But I would like to introduce uh, the panelists, please. And if you can call, all come up and actually sit. And as I was saying, you know, uh, climate action and climate accounting, a uh, special interest group has been doing a lot of work within our community as well. And many of our members um, and our community members uh, do as well. So we invited uh, three guests um, who can really talk to the topic um, that we're talking today. So let's go ahead and just have everybody introduce themselves. So Nancy, since you sat next to me first, you get to go first. Um, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you're working on, and um, then we'll go to Melanie. Hi, I'm Nancy Norris. Um, I work for the government of British Columbia in Canada. Um, and specifically, my ministry is energy mines and low carbon innovation. Uh, we are working on a pilot project and have been for the past two years, which is allowing uh, operators in natural resource producers in British Columbia to share information about their sustainability performance. It's called the Energy and Mines Digital Trust. And we're using Hyperledger Indian Aries as the base technology um, to uh, allow for um, verified credentials. So in BC, we have strong climate legislation. We have our economy is uh, based on natural resourcing, uh, natural resource production, uh, in a large part. And um, we also um, have uh, an ad are advanced in terms of digital technology for uh, individuals. So this pilot is uh, taking that technology uh, for individuals and applying it uh, for businesses, specifically natural resource operators. Um, it's allowing them uh, to, as issue, uh, there's a three components to the pro to the uh, the pr uh, pilot that we're working on. Uh, there's an issuer of a credential, a holder of the credential, and then the verifier of the credential. Those are the three parties in the exchange of information. Uh, for this pilot that we're working on, um, the issuer is a carbon auditor. So in this case, it's PwC. The holder of the credential is a, a mine uh, within British Columbia called Copper Mountain Mine. And the verifier is um, actually the provincial regulator for uh, carbon emissions. In British Columbia, carbon emissions, if you emit over a certain level, you have to provide those that emissions data to the government on an annual basis. So um, the, the pilot that we're working on has these three components to it. And um, we are uh, building on this uh, for also for natural gas operators in the future. Well, that's a lot to follow. <laughs> this is fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm Melanie Cutlin, and I'm Managing Director, and I lead our blockchain and XR capabilities uh, at Accenture. And we've got a broad um, suite of uh, capabilities within that. And so supply chain, transparency, track and trace, as it leads to sustainability, it continues to be a continuous evolution of priorities of of where is, where is everything coming from? How do I understand the providence of my goods? As well as a team focused on carbon markets and rethinking how do we take all the momentum that we're seeing ex in exchanges and applying that to carbon markets as well. Thanks. So, hello together. Andreas Kind is my name. I'm in charge of cybersecurity and trust in Siemens. Siemens is a, a by now 175-year-old company. Um, really have, has a lot of products and solutions in um, the um, industries that really touch into the real world, like train systems, like energy networks, uh, factories, uh, city systems, and so on. And in this uh, situation, we touch, of course, a lot um, with uh, climate change. Um, and we noticed this uh, very prominently in, in one of our leader um, flagship factories, where our customers ask us about the products coming out, what the product carbon footprint would be. And uh, being sort of at that point in a supply chain uh, is typically that 80% is determined in the supply chain, so in, in the supply. Uh, and uh, that created really the uh, problem statement for us to come up with a solution, not just for us, but for other companies as well, to solve uh, this data uh, uh, transparency issue uh, around um, emission data, but also broader, any kind of ESG data. So that's why uh, here the community really uh, brings us the technology uh, to solve this issue. Uh, so it's a, it's a community that really believes in uh, the 
decentralization as the key element for solving uh, a trust problem. And uh, with climate, we do have indeed a, a, a trust problem because we have multiple participants and ecosystems that uh, need to be trusted. And there was a, th a fourth panelist um, that also was going to be participating. Unfortunately, he was unable to travel uh, to Dublin, um, Doug with uh, Circular, Doug Pelston. And, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about, and across a lot of use cases when it comes to, like, innovative or emerging technology, is that when regulations um, start, um, you know, being formed and coming down from different governments and globally even as well. So um, things like the EU battery regulation and the German battery pass and the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act that have very specific climate goals in regards to sustainability and manufacturing and uh, uh, EVs, et cetera. So maybe you can tell us, you know, Nancy, you mentioned it a bit as well on Canada. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing from a regulatory perspective and how these technologies can address some of those regulatory requirements? Sure. Um, so for our pilot, um, we it's been going on for a couple of years, and we have really found that uh, the best way to um, test the technology is to build on an existing uh, process that is a result of legislation and legislative requirements. So in BC, we have these climate climate legislation, particularly for industry, and the process that we're mapping using this digital technology, it already exists, except that people are emailing PDFs uh, of their audited carbon emissions data, or they're filling out web forms for every single mine in BC or every single natural gas operating facility or any large emission, so cement suppliers, any one who emits over a certain level. So um, what we're testing, but through this pilot, is the opportunity for these credentials that we're designing with carbon emissions data, um, not only to be submitted to the government, but also uh, then the, the holder of that credential, the, the uh, operator, the mining operator in this case, can also use that credential to access um, emerging markets for sustainably sourced goods. Uh, they could send it to ev investors, to buyers. Uh, they could also use it for reputational gain reasons, like sending it to um, uh, uh, voluntary carbon re reporting platforms that are using the same sort of technology. Yeah, I mean, regular, from the regular, regulatory side, there there um, are growing um, demands coming up. So we see it uh, in our side, really from the big initiatives um, that, uh, for instance, in Europe, but other countries as well, um, are coming up now. The Green Deal, for instance, in Europe, uh, which is um, very much around taxation or uh, charging for uh, carbon emissions, so either when they they cross the uh, the border when coming into the European uh, area, but in future we see more and more um, really with respect to um, having the need to really understand the emissions of a particular product. So we, we have it today in the reporting on a corporate level, but it will come more and more towards um, sites like the mining sites example, but then really also to the individual products. Uh, and that's uh, much harder then because it's it's the the granularity is very different. So here we expect really uh, more and more re regulatory um, um, yeah, frameworks coming up, coming up, and the companies see this in advance and want to be prepared for this. So one of the things that um, it reminds me of is kind of like the diamond industry. You know, six years ago with the Kimberley process and Everna uh, Everledger and the work that they did, right, it was a process that needed to be digitized. And it's really about the data, right, and tracking the data and having the trust in the data. You know, Andreas, you talked about that before. Um, so maybe, you know, Talk a little bit about, share uh, the increasing role of sustainability data tra tracking um, and how is that important to the solutions and the kind of the data, the actual technology that you need to use in order to achieve that? Thanks, Daniela. I, I think it is, it all comes down to what data do you have so you know how many 
carbon offsets do you need? Right? So if you can't verify what is in your supply chain and in your products, as you mentioned. And so even just in an indirect company like Accenture, which is a knowledge company, right? We have to, to measure what are what are what is the impact from what we purchase. Um, so we built a true supplier marketplace actually on um, Hyperledger Fabric uh, a few years ago and continued the momentum it's turned into our sustainability hub where we now hold our ESG questionnaires and we continue to engage with who is in our supplier base. As we pivot into the food industry, it's really interesting. Most companies I talk to don't actually know what farmer grows the food that goes into their products, right? They don't know all the way back down the chain because it gets aggregated along the way. And so these provenance solutions continue to have an even more important point in this industry now because now to get the data and to make it verifiable and accurate and using the, the whole framework that you talked about um, is became, becoming the, the farm to fork model all the way through a supply chain or all the pieces and parts in an ingredient. So, and, and the sustainability angle seemed to be the, the tipping point that really took a project that had a value proposition in a case into its table stakes now, right? Because if I get this data wrong, um, we're kind of missing the point and blockchain just fits so perfectly around both the transparency of what's in your product as well as your ability to have verifiable steps along the way as to what were the impact of each of the products. Yeah, maybe to add to this, um, there are sort of um, ways of uh, tracking data in the blockchain context where people say, oh, it's blockchain acts like a, like a notary in a way. So it could be public, it, it helps to achieve uh, transparency. Um, but we should also address the need for confidentiality that we also have in the supply chain. So in production, for instance, um, a manufacturer would not want to reveal anything about the specifics, how a product is actually created in terms of sourcing uh, of the, the, the components, the, the suppliers. Also, the own logistics is very confidential. And both um, determines the product carbon footprint or whatever uh, sustainable metrics would be associated with the product. Uh, so we have to, in this data challenge, uh, address the transparency in one way, but also the fact that not everybody wants to share everything. And, and again, I think this community, or this, uh, the, the Hyperledger Foundation has technology to address exactly uh, th these two, two things that when they, when they come together. Um, and uh, it was mentioned verifiable credentials. I, I, we, from our side, also believe very much into this technology um, because here we have the possibility to follow the, the traditional relationship that companies would have with their suppliers and with their customers. So credential is passed along these peer-to-peer -peer relationships and blockchain underneath then helps to do the actual verification in terms of the public keys, the, the schemas that are, that are made available. But the actual data is not then sitting in a uh, decentralized ledger uh, and people are not really worried about um, you know, who's actually seeing them, uh, is it really protected because it's my confidential data. Um, well, you know, I think, you know, the privacy and also the security of the data becomes, uh, you know, a very important aspect. But the concept of verifiable credentials, um, we in the industry speak about it because we're in it on a day in, day out basis. I think it is getting to, you know, same, you know, self-sovereign identity, digital identity, verifiable credentials. These are all terms that I think in the next few years, if not sooner, are going to be part of the business and technical vernacular when people are talking about data projects and, and, and trust um, and collaboration and consortiums and networks and networks of networks, right? We've always said it's not going to be one network to rule them all. These supply chain use cases have to go across various networks. So it becomes more and more important that government agencies, um, that the private sector um, and the service providers understand uh, verifiable credentials. but. Also very importantly, the consumer, consumer themselves. Um, so we are about to launch a course, a uh, free edX course around self-sovereign identity. It's for business and technical leaders, much like we did in 2016 when we launched Enterprise Blockchain and got the market interested in it. Over 200,000 people have taken that course. Um, we really believe that the time is now to educate the users um, and the builders as well. So. Nancy, maybe some of your thoughts as a, as a government uh, representative of why verifiable and cre uh, credentials and also why governments should get involved in the actual development of the code and the standards that are happening currently. Sure. 
Um, so from our government's perspective, um, <clears throat> we have found that verified credentials have all of these, uh, these attributes associated with uh, the technology that we think uh, can create business efficiencies for companies within BC. We also think that uh, the um, interoperability of verified credentials and open source technology is something that governments should be uh, involved with and being able to understand and have um, our own knowledge based on pilots uh, such as the one that we're working on I think is invaluable for governments in order to understand how to participate and um, enable blockchain within uh, digital government systems. Melanie, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about how, how you explain it to your customers? <laughs> how, how do we explain verifiable credentials? I, I, it's funny, early days in blockchain, right, we, we started every process flow with get registered <laughs> and then get started with your, who are you doing business with, know your supplier, know your, um, know your customer in whatever industry or regulation you're in. And this concept of being able to have a credential that I have and I share with those components that I wanna share, back to your privacy point, right, is, um, is critical to it. And some of these can be, I loved your examples of like, regulatory and actually government um, credentials, but some are self-attested credentials, right? So it's just as important what information you're sharing about your organization that you 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 actually write down that it's accurate and, um, and you certify it, um, information about yourself. And so the ability to have a, a suite of credentials and say, I can share this with you for a period of time and not always and forever, and that data is not getting replicated around the world is so, it, important and that as we become those network of networks as you talked about right that we are able to engage much more efficiently and i've seen this open source movement just start to accelerate the oh that's a utility i can grab that i can do that and i can build upon it in my context and in my framework versus constantly going back to trying to think through i have to create a, a data profile and i need to like we're, we're doing that all the time right like sourcing organizations have been solving this problem forever and it's fantastic we're seeing that network continue. Uh, and maybe, Andrea, you can address it from, you know, we talked about you know, kind of government getting involved from a regulatory perspective as well, the people process it. What about the machines? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, true. Typically, identity, we think about people, uh, and sometimes we think about organizations as well. Um, but then we have the things as well. Uh, and uh, sort of prominent example is a, a car goes to a charging station, uh, maybe it's an autonomous car in the future, and there, there's a, yeah, a transaction going on which involves payment uh, potentially as well. Uh, and there we have two things that are supposed to trust each other because they're not necessarily uh, come from the same trust domain. If it's a Tesla and a Tesla network, okay, they, they trust each other because they come from the same trust domain. But this is not always the case and we uh, complain very often that there are so many networks and where we come it's the wrong network i don't have the membership with this particular network for charging but also for other uh, in other cases um, so here in the future the more uh, we digitize the things around us uh, the the more they are connected we we will have more of these use cases where things need to interact with each other and need to trust each other um, one example, we, we drive uh, currently more as a research project, but uh, seriously drive with um, the Deutsche Bahn, uh, Siemens and some other partners as well, is uh, how components within a train communicate with each other. It's a highly safety critical uh, environment, uh, a train you know, passing with uh, high speed uh, people inside. Um, and it's for recording purposes, um, there are there's a need for jurisdictional uh, recording um, by law. But the, the railway law uh, tells this to have a, a recording that could always uh, go back what actually happened. And you have to then really understand which component did what in what millisecond. Um, but also for uh, maintenance cases or, or less um, yeah, critical things, but operational things, maintenance uh, topics, we need uh, this interaction and trust relationship between things. Uh, and that, yeah, is, is a technology thing that you need a root of trust in the things because it's not a person, not a wallet, that nobody presses a button. But uh, you, be, you have to be sure that the communication really comes from this device. Uh, so the, the, the crypto means the, the schemes we actually have, but they have to be implemented then on these devices. So 
Um, I have one more question. Um, we'll go around and then we'll uh, get some questions from the media. That would be great. Um, so we're here at the Hyperledger Foundation. We're an open source uh, project uh, under the Linux Foundation. Um, and why is open source important to all of us? Um, why do companies like Siemens and Accenture and the government of British Columbia show up, um, bring developers, um, contribute? Um, why is open source important and collaboration when we're talking about you know, climate action requirements? Um, for our government, uh, we find that open source is a really important component uh, because what we're trying to build is something that's interoperable with as many different systems as possible. Um, we are we need to be agnostic. Uh, we can't uh, pick and choose any particular system. Um, so, open source community is uh, is wonderful in that we are uh, able to build something. Um, a technology that works for our purposes, but then is also has contributions from uh, developers around the world, um, and also is something that can be scaled, because uh, the ecosystem that we're developing, it can only be uh, uh, useful if there's multiple different parties that are have adopted it and are using it. So um, open source is uh, the, what we have found is, is the, the way for um, trying to encourage the broadest adoption possible. The open source, and the, is at the heart of this, right? Because we have to create, stand, and Hyperledger is really at the heart of this, creating standards that we can all adopt. As we, we started early on in much of this, trying to track and trace our sustainability and understand what were the needs of a custom project after custom project. And, and where could we find those reference architectures and the frameworks that actually then adopt, uh, got us to speed to adoption, right? Through um, being able to build on utilities and the projects um, across the, across the Hyperledger suite that really help you to accelerate movement to get to the outcomes you want. Because business leaders are buying outcomes, right? Like I want to confirm that the data I have around my sustainability is accurate and I'm reporting it correctly. And it's an obvious, yep, there's a ledger behind that, <laughs> whether it's paper or PDFs or um, in a system and now moving to blockchains, it's, it's, it's needed everywhere. And so I think that ability to just drive that open source to say, I'm contributing, I'm adding on. There, are, If we put this through a standard product backlog, everyone would be fighting of my industry or my application or my customization is waiting first, right? And this ability to really engage the network to say, let's add on to these frameworks and build on um, is getting us a feature and function list that allows us to really accelerate adoption. Yeah, I would say pretty much the same thing, particularly in the, um, uh, uh, sustainability context, uh, carbon emissions, we see currently uh, really the big need to have a common way of collecting data. Uh, so there are initiatives from the World Economic Forum, from the, um, uh, the uh, uh, um, business, uh, World Business Council for uh, Sustainable Development, the Pathfinder project, to actually converge on uh, data formats. Um, how to collect uh, data and, and th that cannot be a single company would never be able to to come up with this kind of agreement because everybody else would say no it's coming from this company and the same is then when in when this is gets implemented so I think it needs this convergence sometimes it's also convergence through a meta level that we understand there's greenhouse gas protocol way of collecting data there's an ISO standard and you need a meta level to let people understand the data so that we don't end up with different uh, data sets that are completely uh, sort of independent from each other. Um, and, and this naturally leads then to uh, technology that is driven in the open space, so in the, in the open. Uh, and that we are, yeah, we are very much um, supporting this and, and, and use uh, yeah, Hyperledger and whatever the Linux Foundation. And I, you know, I just want to point that, um, how old is Siemens? How, how many years? 175, right? Um, government of British Columbia, uh, you know, I, I right? Um, and these mines are not going to go away. I mean, these are solutions that are being built that are going to be long term. And so, you know, when you think about what kind of technologies do you want to do that with, 
doing it with proprietary software that is attached to one vendor or even one vendor business community um, becomes very difficult. So you know we you know we love the support of Siemens. They have developers coming on board, and the government of British Columbia and certainly Accenture. But I think just the doing this in the open um, helps us build these systems that are going to you know basically power the systems that our children, their children's children, are going to use. So um, that's my uh, say on why open source is important here as well. Um, I'll go ahead and pause, and uh, if there's any questions, uh, we're happy to answer any questions from uh, either the Zoom or in the room. My question is just the urgency, like w this is my, me as a consumer, but how much pressure are you guys getting it from your customers, from stakeholders to really solve this problem? Is it, is, it, is it my imagination or is there a huge amount of urgency or a growing amount of urgency? Yeah. There's a huge amount of urgency uh, for sure. We see, we see it that um, customers asking for um, information about sustainable uh, products or the sustainability of a product and we cannot answer it uh, and that uh, means yeah potentially there's a deal being lost also um, in uh, with our own customers we we see how much they really want to have solutions in this space uh, so that, that that there's a huge urgency uh, and it's it's coming I think from the consumer side, because you go to the supermarket and you see a neutral product, you would rather pick this one because somehow you feel responsible uh, for climate change. But also from the investor's side, um, there are these uh, goals that big companies like, like Siemens and others have on science-based targets. Um, there are also, there's pressure from the regulatory side, we spoke about this before. So from, from various sides, uh, there's more and more pressure coming in, so the urgency is re really there. I mean, just everything and. <laughs> yes, I totally agree. Um, it just It's not just urgency, it's table stakes, right? Like we've all made commitments to, you know, bettering the environment. Every company has internalized it to different roles and goals. And now what I find is interesting is the business case had efficiencies. You talked about it in the middle of it. But it's also now it's table stakes because it's the right way to do business. And we're able to measure, right, that that consumer demand is shifting and changing and being able to actually verify that that data is behind the scenes gives you an even leg up faster, right? So faster speed to market of being able to verify versus make a broad claim, right? Kind of starts to differentiate you in a crowded shelf space as well. So it's not just urgency. I think it's just kind of the way we're going, going forward. Um, I would say for the government of BC, it's, it's maybe not about urgency, it's about opportunity. Uh, we have, this legislation, we have very strong environmental legislation, climate legislation. We're already asking all of the companies and operators within British Columbia to meet these goals. So if we can provide them with a solution that allows them to use that data to access markets that privilege or are looking for responsibly sourced goods, um, if we can allow them to uh, use that data to build reputation for themselves, um, and also, uh, if we can um, assist them with uh, climate reporting, not just to the government of British Columbia, but to the government of Canada um, and other uh, regulators that they are um, dealing with, then that's an opportunity for them. And it's also a way for us to learn about the technology and understand how government can adopt it. Just one of the other things that's interesting is people are investing in tech in this space. This isn't I had a legacy tool to measure this stuff, and now I need to go replace the legacy stuff. We're building something from scratch, so why not use the toolkit of new tools like out there, which is an interesting differentiator across the board and why I think it's getting a lot of blockchain. Any other questions? Great. Thanks very much. So from... What you were saying, it sounds a bit like the problem is shifting from the technology uh, in terms of multi-enterprise networks to kind of process standardization. Uh, I mean, you mentioned verifiable supply details, for example, and that could be a game changer for payment fraud, for example, if multiple enterprises are involved. But presumably, if suppliers are being asked for nine different sorts of questionnaires, 
uh, you know, that becomes far more complicated. So I wonder if that's something you were seeing, uh, and maybe on the Siemens side, for example, you're having to like train out your suppliers, for example, to use these platforms or change the way your processes work to account for them. Um, so the idea is really that um, we have uh, a start um, where one company says, okay, I, I really want to find out what is the PCF protocol footprint of this product. So in order to do this, I can scope one, scope two, I can do my own, but scope three is difficult. So I reach out to my suppliers. And the idea is not to necessarily force them, but to tell them, here is a link. If you click on it, you, you, are, uh, you can go through this form and it takes you by the hand and leads you to the sort of complicated like path how, how to come up with um, a carbon footprint uh, for your, again, level two and level three. And then they find out, oh, I have exactly the same issue because I have, I have components. So again, they could choose the very same system. And this is completely free. So there's no commercial interest uh, in, in basically helping the companies to uh, acquire the information. And they can, but they don't have to, uh, use a certifier to issue the credentials then. They could self-certify it as well. If it's a small company, that's completely okay because it would be, anyway, too expensive uh, for uh, a smaller company. And then the hope is that it is like an avalanche that the standard that is driven through uh, an association, actually, the Stanium Association, it's not um, Siemens driven anyway, it's really an ecosystem uh, thing, would propagate and people would uh, through the fact that we also are in the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, WEF, and the other initiatives, that there's really this convergence on the data format, but also on the protocol, uh, uh, the way data is exchanged. So it, it's not that we demand anybody to, to follow, but we feel they, are, they really welcome this, this kind of um, digitalization of collecting particular the, uh, the, the, the scope three emissions, because 90% or 80% is, is in there. If you ask any chief procurement officer, chief um, sourcing officer and such, that they'll all say portal fatigue kills <laughs> opportunities and things, right? The, the theme this year in our supply chain business is the network effect. And it, it is because the, we are so integrated and connected as any value chain and any organization participates in multiple value chains, right? So then it's a, I need to share in your portal, I need to share in your portal. And this is happening today, right? And so the idea and why we're, I think, excited about credentials being a changing piece of this is because if you can actually create a credential pack and say, build this network effect, I can share it with you. <laughs> and then you can use it and share it with him, right? And we start to build this where we actually then have some standards across the board and can share the same information. We're all gathering the same information from each other, right? And our parts go into other people's parts and goods and final products. Um, and, and we are all interconnected and we have a whole piece on the one connected supply chain because uh, it, it, that val we are not just one value chain at a time. And so the more you can take this data, standardize it and bring it between areas, you're actually going to see the utility of value, not just the one business case at a time where we'll start to see a change. Also making sure that you can revoke the data yes. and it goes down the chain as well. <laughs> it's a very important part of it. Do you have a follow-up on that, Andrew? I don't yeah. All right. Any other questions? Any? No? All right. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Andreas, as usual. All of you. Uh, and uh, I get to go home and tell my daughter that I am making a difference when it comes to climate. So thank you. Mm -hmm.